One investor believes emerging markets are poised for a breakout year in 2022. I'm going to share this story and my years of experience. Hi, I'm Andrew Henderson. This is Nomad Capitalist, where we help seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors legally go where you're treated best. Investing overseas is a great way to diversify. You can potentially hold foreign currencies to diversify out of Western currencies, or in some cases in markets like Cambodia, Panama, Ecuador, and others, you can invest in US dollar or in Euro terms. You can get residence or citizenship in some cases, and potentially you can get much higher returns, all while giving your assets a buffer by being overseas and diversifying your portfolio against one kind of country. I've always said, if you're in the US, if you're in Europe, you can invest in those markets, which the US stock market has done very well historically. Is that going to be the case for the next 50 to 100 years? Is the US going to be as relevant? I happen to think in many ways it's not. It'll be interesting to see how the markets perform. And I think that having at least some of your assets overseas is valuable in other markets. And certainly emerging markets, even frontier markets, play a role in that. I make investments around the world in places where I spend time. But here's an article uh, from Fortune magazine. It's by a gentleman named Larry Light, and it makes the case for what we talk about here, which is emerging markets are poised to have a breakout year, and compared to U.S. equities, these stocks are shockingly cheap. Certainly an issue people have brought up. Some of the stuff in the U.S. seems to be at kind of nosebleed valuations. Here's what Larry says. As Baron Nathan Rothschild said, in a classic piece of investing advice, the time to buy is when there's blood in the streets. Nowadays, red ink is washing all over emerging markets, which haven't been doing a lot of emerging lately. To devotees of the storied 19th century British banker, that spells opportunity. Two factors are the root of the slowing economic growth and laggard stock prices of these economies, which include the likes of Brazil, India, Malaysia, and Angola. The pandemic and a decelerating China, whose huge appetite for emerging market goods has diminished. While nobody knows where the coronavirus is going, China is likely ahead to rebound from its slump and whip out its order book again to emerging markets' delight. Meanwhile, investors may have a limited window to buy up emerging market stocks while they are cheap. A drop in business from China, which has made a religion out of economic growth since the 80s, is like cutting off oxygen for emerging countries. China has been the main culprit in emerging markets' travails, says Huang Kim, a portfolio manager at Kanye Anderson Rudnick, where he runs an emerging market investment strategy. A slowing China, for instance, means less construction, less needs for metals from Africa. Chinese massive imports, according to Macro Trends research firm, peaked in 2018 at $2.5 trillion, dipped by 2.5% in 2019, then by 4.8% in 2020, and likely some more in 2021. Goldman Sachs just cut China's gross domestic product forecast from 4.8% to 4.3% for 2022. Uh, those numbers are certainly lower than what they were before. So the article goes on and on and on. Uh, but the idea here is you have seen some of these emerging market currencies getting beat up. Uh, you've seen Colombia kind of go back to some of its record lows. Brazil has hit new lows. Turkey has hit far and away uh, new lows. You've seen certain markets uh, hold up relatively well. We've talked about, for example, the Armenian dram up against the U.S. dollar as I sit here in the last five years. Uh, there aren't that many like that, though. Uh, the Malaysian ringgit has, you know, kind of been back and forth a little bit. Um, but the bottom line is, Asia in particular, uh, I'm a believer, will do very well this century. I think I'm not the only one who believes that. Uh, I, for years, talked about Cambodia as a real estate play. It is a place where you can still get good yields. You can still get great appreciation. And why is a frontier market like that very interesting? Because you have the presence of China. You have people coming in. Nearly a decade ago, I went to see a nukeville. I stayed in a very cheap, as much younger, a very cheap hotel, very close to the beach. It was incredibly cheap, $15 a night, maybe. And, I mean, it was very uh, charming. It would, you would walk out um, on kind of a, a dark, unlit uh, planks out to this kind of one flickering light sitting out in the sea where a guy was selling $1 cocktails. He was making them out there, and he didn't have a license, he didn't have anything. It was very interesting, very uh, freeing. That's gone as the goal is to now make Sea Nukeville the new Macau, as Macau threatens to perhaps crack down and, and threaten some of the casinos there. And so now they've turned this into this booming resort town. That has been a boon. 
I think it's probably too late there. What you could have bought there 10 years ago when I was there was, was incredible. Where I've spent a lot more time recently is in Phnom Penh, the capital, where what you see is in this region of Southeast Asia, money from China, money from within the region, money from Singapore and other countries is coming in. And you're seeing these big companies from all over Asia come in and open up malls, offices, hotels, everything. They're buying up entire city blocks. And so people who bought real estate, the prices we talked about in 2013, 14, and even more recently, are doing very well. You have opportunities to invest in growing stock markets in other parts of Southeast Asia. Um, and so you know, Thailand has gotten beaten up. Thailand was overvalued. I think the real estate market was overvalued. There may come a time, and this is not financial advice, but uh, to, to get back into Thailand. Uh, Vietnam has become increasingly interesting. Um, you certainly have some markets like Myanmar and Laos that are pretty much not investable. Uh, Mongolia has fallen off of some people's radar, but you've got a number of interesting places. Indonesia, a place that has, has done relatively well in my portfolio. And so Southeast Asia, very interesting. Indonesia, a country where no one even thinks about how it's one of the most populous countries in the world and growing um, will eventually surpass uh, the population of, of the U.S. You have you know, other areas, Middle East and North Africa, not as much in favor with many people that I talk to, but there are certainly pockets of opportunity there. The article mentions Africa. Um, you, know, you can get in either in starting businesses, either investing in businesses. There are a lot of frontier investments there. Uh, Malaysia, you know, yes, the stock market was one of the worst performers. India, been one of the biggest performers, I think the number one performer in my portfolio, people calling for further growth. Angola, kind of off the radar. Uh, but indeed, interesting. Brazil, opportunities, and it's the one place that we're talking about where you can go and get residence and citizenship as an investor. So it's a bonus, emerging market investment, get your residence permit, you can work towards citizenship if you want. Their currency was totally beaten up. Colombia, I think, also you know, has, has dealt with some stuff in the last couple of years, um, but I think still investable. I think still you know, a, lot of, a lot of interesting things going on there. And so you see stock markets increasing in some of these countries. Um, there are new funds that are you know, helping people invest in countries in Central Asia, for example. Uzbekistan is one country that has stood out. And so you know, what we always talk about is markets are liberalizing. And so you have countries that, that once weren't in the game, the Uzbekistans, the Cambodias, the Angolas. Then you have countries that have been emerging markets have been reliable to some extent for, for decades, like in Malaysia, for example, or in India, or in Indonesia. People have known about these that have gotten banged up. The currencies have taken at least a little bit of a hit, in some cases a big hit. You can go in and buy a discount. I'm not a stock picker. I'm not telling you where to go. But what I am saying is, if you have the opportunity, with all the chaos that's going on right now in the world, um, in the West and elsewhere, to diversify some of your money, yeah, get your Malaysian residence permit, go and open a bank account. The bank account uh, will either allow you to invest in a brokerage account somewhere else, or you can invest in certain stocks, ETFs, what have you. Uh, you know, find somewhere to invest in a Cambodia. Get, even, you know, get a brokerage account in Asia that gives you all the access in Asia. Some of the more common Western brokerage accounts, like an interactive brokers, aren't gonna have nearly the coverage. They have a lot of coverage, but they're not gonna have a lot of the coverage you want in emerging markets. In, uh, areas where there's a lot of opportunity. So an Asia-focused brokerage account could be good, either with one of the big banks in, let's say, a Singapore, in a country like Malaysia, or Thailand, if you've got a residence permit. Uh, those could be very interesting. So, uh, you know, we had some great success in U.S. markets, in Western markets, for years. Is that going to continue? My advice, or just not even my advice, but what I am doing, is making sure that if you want to have some money in U.S. equities, you want to have some money in U.S. debt, you want to have some money in U.S. real estate, whatever, that's fine, or Western, wherever you live. Why not take a small piece of what you're doing? By the way, for certain people, you could even use your current retirement account, move that retirement account offshore, put those investments in there. So if you've got a retirement account that's not performing and you want to keep your non-retirement account assets, that could be an option for some people. So look at these markets. Uh, they mentioned India, Malaysia, Angola, Brazil. I mentioned uh, Cambodia, Colombia, uh, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, you could also look at a place like Turkey, gotten badly beaten up. The central bank came in and said, hey, if you invested our 13% interest rates and you lose money, don't worry, we'll give you the money back. Um, not really an investment to put money in the bank, but there are certainly some real estate deals there. Uh, I think in the long run, that will be, uh, you'll see some good deals. Even look at some of the REITs in places like Singapore. Uh, look at REITs in places in North Asia. 
you've got much better valuations, much higher yields than what you'd find in similar you know, REITs, for example, in the Western world. And so a lot of opportunity in Asia, in emerging markets, that's what Fortune says, and it's what we've been saying for a long time. Don't stop now. We've got well over a thousand more videos here on YouTube for you to watch and learn how to go where you're treated best. And if you want to work with Nomad Capitalist personally, go to nomadcapitalist.com apply, learn about our unique tried and true process, garnered over years of experience, and learn how you can become our client.